morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday worship gathering and happy uh, Thanksgiving as we move into this Thanksgiving season. Um, as followers of Jesus and wherever you are in faith, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, but for our community and, and as people seeking to follow Jesus, uh, we are a people that are ultimately thankful. Um, we should be thankful all the time for all, all that God does and that he's given us life and hope and meaning and purpose. I'm going to open this morning with a reading from Ephesians 1. We're, we're walking through Ephesians in our messages. And uh, this message uh, today will be in, in Ephesians 4, but Paul opens this letter by sharing just so many good things about who God is, what he's done. Um, so there's a lot for us to be thankful for. And in times like this, with kind of crazy times and COVID times, um, it's, it's so important more than ever to, to set our sights upon God uh, and be thankful for all he's done. So hear this word as our word of introduction today. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. He's made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we've also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. Good morning again. Set your hope on Christ. We are actually meant to live for the praise of his glory. We can be in him. We can know him. He is the one to be with and know. Remember that at this time, even as we worship uh, while we're far apart. So good morning again. Good to see you all. Let's worship the Lord in song. Who is this King of glory that pursues me with his love and haunts me with each hearing? Of his softly spoken words My conscience a reminder Of forgiveness that I need Who is this king of glory Who offers it to me Who is this king of angels Oh blessed prince of peace Jesus. 
precious Jesus, the Lord Almighty. trying times, you always lead us back to you, back to your cross. Your heart, 
cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Lead me, lead me to when my I belong to you, Lord, lead me, lead me to the cross, the cross, the cross, lead me to your cross. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show.
For our prayer this morning, I'm actually going to read one of the prayers in Ephesians. There's two prayers in Ephesians where Paul prays for the church. Um, and these are prayers that we should come back to time and time again. So I'm going to read the prayer from Ephesians 1, 15 to 22, and then uh, I'll lead us in prayer. So hear this prayer from Paul and then hear my reflection on it. Um, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he's put all things under his feet, has made him head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Lord, I come before you uh, and simply ask that um, you would give us, your people, all those listening, a, a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Lord, we try to find life in our own power. We try to find the good in our own power. We try to make sense of things in our own power, and we fail. We try to come up with our own truth in our own power, and we fail. Forgive us. Forgive us for trying to run life in our own power, for setting our hopes on our own hopes, for trying to build our own inheritance. When you are the good giver, Lord, reveal yourself to us. Give us your wisdom and insight. Open our heart eyes so that we might know the hope that we have in you, the inheritance we have in you, and the great power we find in you. Lord, you have the power to conquer death and hell. Um, Lord, you inherit the world. <laughs> uh, this is all yours, Jesus, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And yet you invite us, you call us, you say, hey, what's mine is yours. You can be in me. You can be with me. Lord, help us get that today. Help us get the glorious inheritance that we have in you. Help us get what it means to know you and to love you and to follow you. Fill us with that. Fill us with your love and grace and truth. Help us trust you and your power. Help us put all of our hope in you. Lord, in this season, it can be difficult. Help us keep the faith in you. Lord, reveal yourself for those who are downcast, for those who are suffering, for those who are hurting, for those who are far away from you. Show yourself. Redirect us towards you. Redirect our hearts and minds towards you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. You are the good God who created the heavens and the earth. You are the God who redeems and forgives. You are the God with power. You are the God who brings new creation. Help us trust you in this hour. Lord, help us be open to the word you have for us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today I will be continuing in our sermon series looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. I'll be continuing in chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 and going to verse 16. If you have been with us for these last few weeks, you know that Paul was tackling the problem of disunity within the church, pointing out that as followers of Jesus, we are all unified as one because each of us have the indwelling Holy Spirit that makes us one. Paul has pointed out that our right standing before God is not earned through our good works, but is instead a gift of God, made, of, made available to, to all of us. 
Because of this, no one can boast and, and place themselves above others. Each of us are equals in terms of our inheritance as children of God and in terms of our citizenship in the kingdom of God. Achieving this oneness in practice starts with a greater understanding of Christ's love for us. And this is why Paul prayed that wonderful prayer in chapter 3. And as we begin to grasp the love of Christ, His beauty, as Pastor Jared spoke of last week, His beauty is revealed to us that we may place ourselves at His feet under His lordship and authority. Christ then becomes the model for which we are to emulate. As Pastor Jared read last week, Paul explains to us Christ's model in his letter to the church in Philippi. Paul says that Christ emptied himself, becoming a servant. In other words, the Creator placed himself under the authority of the created to the point of death on a cross so that we might be reconciled to God for all eternity. That's the model. Don't be full of yourself. Empty yourself. Love one another as Christ loved you. Put the needs of the other ahead of your own as Christ did for you. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and serve one another in love. This can only be done through our cooperation with the Holy Spirit as He conforms us to, to be more Christ-like, keeping our selfishness and our pride in check as we continue to die to self and place ourselves under the Lordship of Christ always keeping in mind how incredibly much He loves us and how He is for us and wants what is best for us from, e uh, from an eternal perspective. So as we saw last week in the first six verses of chapter 4, Paul implores us to be diligent in persevering our Unity through humility, gentleness, patience, and tolerance for one another in love. Again, reminding us that we are one, together under one God, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And then he begins verse 7 with the word but. And in that one word but, Paul is saying, in light of everything I have just written about equality and unity and oneness, I'm about to reveal something that is very important to keep in mind. I'm about to reveal something that is so profound it may at first sound like a contradiction. I'm about to reveal something that may even at first sound unfair. However, what I'm about to reveal is vitally important to the effectiveness of the church and its mission to reach others with the gospel. And here it is, verse 7. Each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. So Christ gives each of us a gift with different measurement. In other words, he is not giving us the same gift or the same amount of giftedness. Christ is purposely creating greater diversity. You know, in, in the beginning of this letter, there, there was diversity, right? Jews and Gentiles that caused disunity. And, and Paul shows us that you know, how the Spirit unifies the diverse into one and now within that oneness, Christ diversifies even more. Think of it this way. 
Each of us is a flower with similarities and differences that make us individually unique and beautiful. The Spirit unifies us into one bouquet, which, which makes, us even, makes us together even more beautiful. And then Christ, the Creator, adds additional colors to each of us as individuals, making the bouquet as beautiful as possible. In the church, the, the unity we have, which is demonstrated in the love we have for one another, is our greatest witness. But it becomes most beautiful and most appealing when it is revealed in the bouquet of diversity. Diversity makes our witness, our mission, more effective. Diversity in unity is difficult for many to wrap their heads around, especially in a culture that no longer has reverence for God. For example, by law, every U.S. company has to comply with Equal Employment Opportunity Commission law and have an Equal Employment Opportunity Statement to be followed as part of their hiring practices. Now, this is a good thing. It, it is to try and make sure that there is no prejudice in hiring and that the, the best person is hired for the job. This is good for the company because you want the most talented people, but it is also good for the country, its citizenry, and for the economy. One of the most inclusive EEO statements, as they're called, that I could find is Dell Corporations, which states this. Dell is committed to the principle of equal employment opportunity for all employees and to providing employees with a work environment free of discrimination and harassment. All employment decisions at Dell are based on business needs, job requirements, and individual qualifications without regard to race, color, religion, or belief, uh, national, uh, social or ethnic origin, sex, including pregnancy, age, physical, mental or sensory disability, HIV status, sexual orientation, gender identity and or expression, marital, civil union or domestic partnership status, past or present military service, family medical history or genetic information, family or parental status, or any other status protected by the laws or regulations in the locations where we operate. Dell will not tolerate discrimination or harassment based on any of these characteristics. Dell encourages applicants of all ages. Very specific in its wording. And to their credit, anyone applying for a job should feel confident that there is nothing that would disqualify them from getting hired other than their, their own qualifications, like their, uh, you know, their, ed their education or certifications or experience or natural strengths, uh, as well as things like you know, enthusiasm and passion and work ethic, you know, et cetera. So again, all of this is good. You know, we're trying to get the best person for the job so the company as a whole operates most effectively to become the best computer company. If the company is true to its hiring practices, it will, as a whole, end up with a diverse company, but diversity may not be evident within specific roles. You see, people tend to gravitate towards things that they are interested in and have a natural uh, inclination for. And of course, that includes, you know, jobs. According to the you know, US Department of Labor Statistics, computer and peripheral equipment manufacturing jobs 
are only 28.3% women. Whereas elementary and secondary school jobs are 75% women. So statistically speaking, if we walked into Dell's manufacturing department, we'd see 72 men for every 100 employees there. Does this mean that Dell is being discriminatory in its hiring practices? Maybe. But Common sense tells us that most likely more men applied for those jobs because on the whole, you know, overall, more men like those jobs and are better gifted in those jobs than women. And the same can be said for the elementary school teachers. You know, when I walk into the elementary school where my wife Barb works as a teacher, I only see a few guys there, you know, the, the gym teacher, another teacher, and, and a couple of custodians. Again, we can ask, is there discrimination? And, you know, perhaps there is, but again, most likely, there are more women elementary school teachers because on the whole, more women are interested in that job and are better suited for that job than men. The problem we have in society right now is that many want to judge the non-discriminatory practices of a company based on these outcomes and want to force companies to rectify these discrepancies. So Dell would have to figure out a way to adjust the male-female ratio in its manufacturing division to equal the male-female ratio in the general population. And the elementary school would, would have to do the same uh, you know, for its teaching staff. Perhaps this example you know, sounds like it even could be solved, uh, but we are only at looking right here at, at male-female ratios. What if we had to look at everything listed in Dell's EEO statement. Now, if we follow that to its logical conclusion, just, just picture Dell, you know, uh, if a guy, you know, quits his manufacturing job there. So the department head would then call down to human resources and say, you know, we have an opening in the manufacturing department. But then he, you know, he'd look through his ratios and, and say to the HR representative, you know, can you hire a you know, Hispanic woman, a woman who is Jewish, single, heterosexual, and served in the military? <laughs> you know, to which the HR person would say, you know, that would take quite a while to find. And not only that, it goes against our own EEO statement. So the, the irony here <laughs> is that in an effort to look non-discriminatory, companies would have to discriminate. <laughs> and if they discriminate, they will be turning away better qualified applicants in order to fill the quota. And this would make the company less effective in meeting its goals, and eventually, that company will fail. So, having this understanding of the culture we now live in, let's go back to Ephesians. So if I could paraphrase verses 7 to, through 10, it would be Christ, you know, the one who suffered, died, and was buried, who rose again and ascended into heaven and now sits on the right hand of God the Father and has been given all authority over heaven and earth, Christ has given each of us gifts in order to fill the necessary jobs or roles associated with the church. Verse 11 reads, The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge 
of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. So, starting with apostles and prophets, Christ gifted these people to hear and then relay and write down God's words, which, which is our Holy Scripture, which is our foundation, right? And, and from there, people were gifted to spread that word, uh, in other words, evangelize. Uh, throughout various parts of the world. And then churches, you know, were planted. And then Christ gifted some to pastor those churches and, and teach in those churches in order to equip uh, others uh, in their gifted ministries and roles within that church. These roles have, you know, specific functions, which Paul compares to parts of a body. And just like the hand can't do the foot's job, one should not perform a role where, you know, you aren't gifted. For, for if you do that, not are you not only using your gift, but you are keeping somebody who has the gift in that particular role that, you're, that you are in, uh, you're preventing them from, from using their gifts, right? So this is why it's so important to seek out your gifts through prayer and by asking others so that you get plugged into your specific purpose here at the church. Paul lists additional gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, uh, but these aren't exhaustive lists, and, and, and many gifts have like nuances that will eventually come to the surface. For example, you may have the gift of teaching, but there are various ways to teach, including writing or uh, through video, and there are various, you know, different people to teach, right? Not, not just adults, but, but children, teens, you know, etc. So, Pray and seek the advice of others. Uh, and as we, as we figure out our gifts and we use these gifts together, we are the body of Christ working with each other, encouraging each other, and building each other up to maturity. Verse 14, we, we must no, no longer then be, be children, you know, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. When we work together in unity, we mitigate the risks of falling back into the patterns of the world that you know, constantly change and are filled with deceit and selfishness. Verse 15, But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. You know, it, is, it is our love that makes us different from the world. And in that love, we must be truthful with one, and or, with one another in order to help people grow in their faith. Uh, so in love, we, we point out sin. You know, not to judge, but to help a brother or sister not fall. And, and we tell the truth concerning our giftedness. A number of years ago, uh, my family, we, we used to watch American Idol. And I remember one show uh, when they were auditioning contestants for the upcoming season. <clears throat> there was this one girl who got up and sang, and she was not good. Uh, Simon, one of the judges who always tells the truth, <laughs> however, not in love, asked her, who told you you could sing? To which she answered, the people in my church I've been singing in the church for years. 
To which Simon responded, they lied to you. <laughs> now here's this, this poor girl has just realized that she has been embarrassing herself in front of the church for years. But, but far worse than that, she has just embarrassed herself in front of six million viewers, all because the church never told her the truth in love. And not only was she not using her true gift this whole time, where, where she would have been truly blessed, but as a result, the church wasn't as effective in its mission. I realize that these can be hard conversations, but the consequences are huge. I'm not sure we can calculate the cost of an ineffective church. Perhaps we are seeing that in our culture today. The church is to celebrate diversity in the context of unity under the authority of God. This is only possible in the bigger, the greater context of love. For without love, all that we say or do is just noise, or as Paul writes elsewhere, a clanging symbol. Finally, verse 16, from Christ, whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. See, as we work together using our, our diverse gifts, uh, working properly as a healthy body, the body grows. In other words, more people come to Christ and join in. The church is thereby continually building in love. The world wants to celebrate diversity in the context of disunity and without love and not under the authority of a sovereign God, but under the authority of self. As I pointed out earlier, earlier, using companies as an example, that celebration will fail miserably. Not just in the context of business, but as a nation and as a world. For they are doing what's right in their own eyes rather than doing what's right as modeled and commanded by Christ. On my desk, I have a Kennedy half dollar. One side says, in God we trust. The other side says, e pluribus unum, which means out of many, one. Diversity in unity under God, that's the only way it works. And I pray our church may be the example. Oh, come to the altar. Let's come before the Lord right now. Let's sing to him. He's in this space. He's in your living room. He's meeting us wherever we are. Wherever we are.
is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Now the benediction. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to ma maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Amen and amen.